As part of our discussion of the future of journalism, we have a panel of four very accomplished, very interesting journalists who do a variety of things uh, in the field to, uh, to talk about how they've gotten where, uh, where they are now and also to engage in, in a discussion of where this crazy thing seems to be uh, headed at the moment. Uh, we have uh, at the very end there Michael Rostin who is on, on the social media desk, an editor in the social media desk of the New York Times. We have, uh, and I'm going to ask them to give uh, a longer bio as part of explaining how they got uh, to these positions. Uh, we have Satel Patel, uh, Patel, am I pronouncing that okay? Yeah, who is now at Market Watch, has been at Fox Business, and is a graduate of another journalism school, <laughs> Northwestern. <laughs> uh, and uh, Rebecca Howard, I've been trying to get to come by for a long time, because she's doing really interesting work in video at the New York Times, and really changing things there. And, uh, and, and I think that's an important part of the... Uh, uh, important thing for us to understand about the direction that journalism is taking. Uh, and finally, we have Charles Holmans, who, who came by this class once before, who's now at The Activist, a long-form journalism site where he's executive editor. But he's, uh, he's done a, a bunch of other things in journalism, too. So why don't we begin by Michael, with Michael uh, for that question, how'd you get <laughs> where you are now? Um, I, I don't know if my, my path to the job I have right now is, is a cautionary tale or not, and I, I also don't know who it's a cautionary tale uh, for if it is. Um, I sort of backed into journalism. I, I didn't go to, to journalism school. I was a political science major in college. Um, in graduate school, actually, I, I studied uh, you know, human rights at Columbia University's uh, School of International and Public Affairs. So. Uh, I think, you know, until um, about halfway through uh, grad school, it hadn't really ever occurred to me that I would work as a journalist. And uh, I had done a lot of work on, uh, you know, websites, uh, more on the content side than ever on the technical or the de development side. But I think uh, I was a person who was always very interested in news, and I think I always consider technology to be something of a hobby. And um, I think that there are a lot of people now who find their way into interesting jobs in news organizations, big and small, who uh, you know, are journalists who consider technology to be a hobby or technology uh, people who consider news to be a hobby. And uh, I think that's really sort of the path that I've been able to take is that as the technology has been developing, as we've gone from uh, you know, more traditional print outlets and uh, video outlets to, uh, you know, the explosion of the blogosphere in, uh, you know, the mid-2000s, uh, you know, to the <laughs> proliferation of uh, social media and the disintermediated, uh, you know, ways that we access information and news now. Um, I just was always trying to make a very strong effort to uh, be able to deal with these things and figure out the right way to convey information or news over them. And um, that's ultimately how I've managed to get from one place to another. Um, I've probably gone from too many places to other places because right now I think uh, very few people have very linear paths in journalism now. The traditions where you know you would start at a small outlet and work your way up to a medium-sized outlet and then hopefully get to one of the best outlets, uh, those paths aren't as easy to come by anymore. And so. I think you'll find a lot of people are going to need to work at a lot of strange startups, some of which are going to be run by crazy people, some of which are just going to run until they run out of money, and then you'll have to find another job. And uh, I've been in a couple of those scenarios, and uh, hopefully I won't be again. <laughs> Sital? Oh, you have one. I'm sitting <laughs> so, um, uh, as, uh, as um, was mentioned earlier, so I work at MarketWatch. I'm a business reporter. Uh, the way I started was that I actually have a business background. I was an accounting and economics major in undergrad. And I did finance for a little while and really didn't like it. So I thought, you know, I'd, I always wanted to be in journalism. I always wanted to, you know, write. At least that's, that's what I thought. <laughs> and uh, I decided, you know, there's two ways you can do it. You can go to grad school and, like, really that helps you switch your career path. 
or you could just, you know, try to get a job at a journalism organization and uh, do it that way. I decided to go to grad school, uh, which really helped me really make a massive change because it was a change and it opened a lot of, op op you know, uh, doors for me. Um, so I went to grad school and that landed me in Washington, D.C. and I worked, ended up working at CNN for um, three years after that, uh, which was a great job. It was like um, a great opportunity for me to understand Washington and politics, working at you know CNN, which has so many resources, so and so many great reporters, you know, at least at the time. So um, it was uh, a great opportunity. And then I decided, you know, I really need to leverage my business background and um, look at you know some of the business networks. And so I moved to New York and I started working for Bloomberg. Uh, for a year, uh, I just worked there for a year, and then I moved over to Fox Business when it launched, and I did that for six years. Um, I cannot say enough about business journalism. Uh, a lot of people, I think, in when they're in undergrad or grad school, don't think about going into business reporting. Um, I it was always in the back of my mind because I have a business background. But most of the journalists that I meet, uh, that I met, you know, my my uh, fellow students. Um, wanted to, and including myself in the beginning, I wanted to, you know, report from Iraq and, um, you know, go there and, like, cover the war and cover all that uh, conflict and uh, other places because it's very exciting. Um, but I'm here to tell you that business news is very exciting, too. <laughs> um, but in any case, I uh, worked at Fox Business, worked for one of the best reporters in the business, um, and he really inspired me to actually stop being a TV producer and um, go into print reporting, which is what I do now, and be the actual reporter. So that's kind of what I'm doing now, and I've been doing that for a year and a half, so. So economics a good double, we require all our students to double major. Oh, so okay. economics wouldn't be a bad idea, mm, would exactly. it? Exactly. <laughs> Rebecca. So my, my path is, real, I think, pretty uh, out of the box, I will say. Um, I, I currently am the general manager of video at the Times. I work on and report up through the business side of the of uh, the Times, but I work very closely and actually sit on an editorial floor and work very closely with the managing editor, who is Bruce Headland, in how we're thinking about making content and moving content forward at the Times. My path, um, I was a political science major. I feel like I have to say that because it makes me feel more legit or something, but I was a political science major, but <coughs> my passion was film. Um, where I went to school, they didn't have a film program, so I couldn't really study film. So right afterwards, I started um, working in movies as quickly as I could and moved out to California and did that whole thing. So I was a production designer for about 15 years. So working on sets and our direct, you know, working in commercials and feature films and a whole different path, always interested in the news, always came from a very politically minded family. So it was, it was always in, in me somewhere, I suppose, but certainly not in any, uh, for in any formal way. And from there, I got a job, I got an executive position at Fox Digital Studio, which was on the lot of 20th Century Fox. And that was a studio that was formed by Fox Searchlight. And the idea was to figure out and incubate new talent that could be mined and, and, and brought up within the Fox family and turned into filmmakers um, for one of the studios. And so that was an incredible job. We had a budget uh, to go out and scout and find young filmmakers. So it was a lot of going to festivals, a lot of uh, meeting with aspiring filmmakers and, and um, helping to support their careers, and we worked mostly with scripted content, so I helped grow that business, and um, you know, similar to you in a sense, when I got that job, it was almost like being at grad school for filmmaking because I got to work with the marketing department. I worked, I learned about the business. It was, almost, it was almost like one of the best experiences of being in the center of a lot where all of this is going around you and you have this access to all this information, so I just soaked it all in, and I think from being around it, just from a set perspective, I'd already, it was kind of already in my, in my blood, and so from there, I was there for three years, and then I was hired at AOL to run um, development of video projects, and that was when video, video was just starting to um, really take note, people were starting to take notice that there was something that we could tell bit bigger stories, more deeper engaging stories with video, and um, at that time, and I got my job six months after AOL purchased the Huffington Post, which I think sometimes looks the opposite, but Huffington Post purchased AOL, but AOL actually purchased the Huffington Post. And that kind of changed my, my road a little bit. I started working really closely with the editors of the Huffington Post and figuring out what kind of content we could make to best um, tell the stories they wanted to tell in the different categories that they worked in. So I got this experience of working with editors across all the desks at the Huffington Post. And then one day I got a phone call. This is one of those things that just like, you get a call, or it was actually an email saying, 
Um, are you, would you ever consider working for the New York Times, running their video strategy? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, of course. Like, who wouldn't want to do that? But, you know, I'm not going to get that job. That seems crazy. But I started interviewing for it and coming out to New York, and I went through rounds and rounds of interviews, and they had me put together a strategy for how I thought the business could, where I thought the business could go for them and what I thought, where they thought they should take it and where I thought um, video journalism was moving towards. And, um, you know, I did it. I pied <laughs> in the sky, and it was really fun to do. It was, again, it was like kind of like being in grad school, and I kind of did this thing thinking this will be a great exercise because it will be really difficult to actually land this job, but I think now going through this and really thinking about it will really help me. And um, I came and I presented to Jill Abramson and to Mark Thompson, and I think I, I think because of my attitude, actually, because I didn't think I was going to get the job, um, I got the job. And it was crazy because I was up against really uh, people from the BBC, people who had worked in journalism, in traditional journalism, for many, many years. And I think uh, it was just one of those things I think it clicked for me and this company because I come from a creative background, but I have a strong mind for business. And sometimes that's a hard thing to straddle. You'll find people that are really good in business but maybe don't have that you know, creative uh, latitude. And I think that I kind of can do both of those things. And I think with this position, it was really important that they had someone that um, had experience working with editors that was creative and uh, business-minded. So I'm finished one year, and I'm still alive. And uh, we've had a, an incredible year, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more during the panel. Yeah, and something, something else has happened. The New York Times, which used to have video of a couple of old guys sitting around talking, maybe, or yeah. talking at you, now has some really interesting stuff right. on video. Yeah. Yeah, it's well, that was one of the first things we kind of decided to get rid of when I got there. You know, and I think it also just because I wasn't connected so much to it, it was easy to come and say, look, it, this is really boring. Nobody likes to watch this. But I wasn't invested, you know, so it was, it was easier for me to make a decision like that. Charles. Um, so I was not a political science major or a major in anything remotely useful. I was a religion major in college, and um, actually, I was kind of a very mediocre like student journalist. But I, I basically wanted to be a like forest ranger when I graduated, and then realized <laughs> way too late that I had to get a degree in forestry to do that. Um, but journalism, fortunately, required no actual training or skills of any kind. So I did manage to get a job at a tiny little paper in Wyoming. Um, where I worked for about a year after college and covered coal miners and rodeos and meth-related crime, and it was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> and then I kind of accidentally, I, I worked in newspapers for a couple of years and accidentally and ultimately kind of unhappily uh, became a Washington correspondent for my hometown paper, which was the uh, Pioneer Press in St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, realized very quickly that I was terrible at it and, and didn't really enjoy it. And um, anyway, I was between jobs in newspapers when the industry like plummeted off a cliff, which is like now kind of ancient history. But this would have been like 2005 when everybody was just like utterly screwed and like you know hemorrhaging money. Actually, believe it or not, like worse than they are now. I think, um, or maybe not. I don't know. Uh, anyway, so I ended up out of work and unemployed for a long time and was you know, increasingly bored and broke. And went and worked at a fish cannery in Alaska um, and totally loved it out there and ended up like finding a public radio station that just kind of needed like a warm body to be in the station. Um, <coughs> and so I worked at uh, and sort of like accidentally did public radio for a while after that out there um, and covered shipwrecks and earthquakes and fun things like that in the Aleutian Islands. I was the, I believe, westernmost reporter in the world for a couple of years. Um, <laughs> And as you can tell, I don't have an awesome radio voice or <laughs> any real presentation skills, so I was like clearly not really cut out for radio. But I, I did start uh, freelancing for magazines when I was out there and found that that was sort of the thing I wanted to do. And so I was writing like basically anything I could possibly get published and like ideally paid for somewhere. I wrote bar reviews for Esquire. I wrote little dispatches about the shipping industry for The Economist and sort of like whatever, basically anything I could convince anybody to like actually assign to me. Um, but I eventually got a job at the Washington Monthly, which is a sort of small political magazine in D.C. And uh, moved there and did that for a while and kind of learned both how to actually write a long story, which I had no real concept of how to do, and also how to edit one, um, which is, a, I think, a sort of underrated skill. As long as something resembling magazines exists, there's like actually a very small number of people who actually know how to edit a magazine story. So if you happen to be one of the few people who do that, even if you're not that great at it, you can get sort of promoted within the industry. Um, so I like, uh, went to foreign policy from there where I was the features editor for a while. 
And then I kind of wanted to go back to writing, and so I freelanced for a bit. I wrote and still write when I have time for the New York Times Magazine and the New Republic and um, Pacific Standard and um, The Atlantic, things like that. Um, but um, yeah, a few years ago, a guy, a guy that I very vaguely knew was launching this thing called The Atavist, which was basically an attempt to use the iPad, which was then a pretty new thing, to uh, sort of expand the boundaries of what you know was known as magazine writing and is now sort of like infelicitously referred to as long form writing. Um, but um, at the time, and this is actually very hard to remember now, but at the time there was like this sort of mindless sense that like people were just reading less and less and uh, like ultimately all media was gonna converge on basically like I don't know, like blog posts that were just like flashing lights or something. <laughs> um, but basically there was no patience for the kind of writing that you know, people used to do a lot more of, which was these sort of you know, very ambitious like 10,000, 15,000 word magazine stories. I mean, now the sort of upper bound of what pretty much all magazines but The New Yorker will publish is probably in the 6,000, like maybe 8,000 range. But it used to be that you know, people wrote these sort of like you know, sprawling, ambitious, sometimes ill-advised and sometimes brilliant pieces of writing, and, and the, um, the two people, two of the three people who founded The Atavist were uh, a, it was basically three guys, none of whom are me. Um, one is now an editor at The New Yorker, the other was a longtime freelance writer for Wired and other magazines. Um, and the third one was a programmer who did a lot of uh, book website design for a lot of the, the big publishing houses. And um, the first of those two guys had worked on a story together for Wired um, that was a very sort of ambitious piece and they were left thinking that it would be really cool to create a forum to do that on a regular basis and also use the you know, then new technology of the iPad and the iPhone to sort of expand what you could do with those stories and include more kinds of materials and you know, hopefully even eventually tell them in a very different way from the way that you know, we write them as magazine writers. And so they launched this thing called The Atavist and it got a lot of good attention early on. Um, and um, we'd been kind of talking for a while and eventually when they had the money, they brought me on as an editor there, and that's still what I do. Um, we put out one story a month, we sell them individually and through subscriptions, and um, yeah, and we're kind of chugging along. We're also now a, a sort of weird hybrid software company where we've launched a kind of self-publishing uh, software that's pretty much exactly what we use to build our own stories, and you know, people can use it to sort of experiment with you know, very kind of rich, cool looking, Web design and, and tablet design and ebook publishing um, for you know basically no money when you start out with it and little money if you decide to keep going with it. Um, so we're kind of exp you know moving on to I guess the sort of new phase of the company, which is both an editorial venture and hoping you know hopefully sort of changing the way that other people are able to to sort of tell stories digitally. So not simple paths to career in journalism, but in interesting. Past. Uh, I have a question for everybody, and then I hope we'll, we'll just sort of get talking more. Uh, my question for Michael is, what happens on the social media desk at the New York Times? What's being done? Uh, the social media operation at the Times has, has changed a lot in the years since it was created. Uh, when it started, it was a, a, single, a single woman from the newsroom name, named uh, Jennifer Preston and a colleague from the business side, uh, and that was it. Uh, and at some point, somebody realized that uh, social media is the delivery system that a lot of people were using in order to uh, you know, find their way to, to our, our journalism and our news stories uh, needed a lot more thought going into it. So uh, they sort of connected the social media operation to uh, something we call interactive news, which is a team within our newsroom that's very actively involved in you know, building applications and things for our website that, uh, you know, make our journalism uh, more interesting in the context of the internet. Uh, you know, if you've uh, seen projects like, uh, you know, Snowfall or uh, our Olympics coverage or a lot of the interesting interactive things that the Times does, a lot of it is uh, built uh, in the technology framework that our interactive news team uh, you know, uh, uses in order to uh, develop ways to produce our journalism.
But the thing is that, uh, you know, as great as our developers are, a lot of them are not inherently journalists. Some of them do have experience in journalism, but some of them are just people who are really, uh, you know, good at coding and also have a strong interest in the news. So that's where the social media desk comes in. It's sort of our role to be the go-between uh, of you know the the different desks at the times and uh, you know the developers, so that we can sort of take the journalistic priorities of all the different sections of the paper and the website and the app and so on, and uh, find out what they want to do and see if there's a way that we can make it more interesting, so that when you come to it on the internet, you won't just click away because it's just text on a page. <coughs> um, so, you know, that means that we're farmed out to different desks. So I, I work with the Culture Desk and the Washington Bureau and our breaking news operation. I work with our new, uh, our new project called The Upshot, uh, our, our, our entrance into the explanatory, uh, you know, journalism uh, field that's uh, blowing up these days with things like 538 and Vox. And I try to make it so that they do a more effective job of telling their stories using social media. Um, I also get to do things like run uh, you know, at NY Times, the you know New York Times Twitter account with 11 million followers. Um, you know, I, I do that two d two days a week, and some of my colleagues do it the other days of the week. And uh, we also work to sort of oversee our Facebook page, which is run by our marketing department, uh, to sort of make sure that there's sort of a more journalistic approach to the way we post things on Facebook, and that we're not just trying to, you know, get the most uh, you know clicks we can. Uh, but make sure that our Facebook page actually informs people of the news that's going on in the world, which you know is ultimately what we're here for. Um, you know, so ultimately, I think that what it's all about for us is using social media as a way to you know convey our storytelling. It's not uh, you know just trying to you know convert everything in the New York Times into the perfect you know 140 character thing that everybody will retweet. We want to sort of take the journalistic values that we have and convey them over social media as opposed to converting, uh, you know, the other way around in which we would sort of put the social media values ahead of uh, the journalism, which I think unfortunately happens uh, at a lot of other news organizations, social media operations these days. Great. So Tom, uh, my question is, why is, why is business such a good area of journalism? And do you see it continuing to grow? Uh, a good thing for students to get into. Sure, yeah, and I, I meant to mention this in the beginning. Um, <laughs> just on a very basic level, um, if you guys don't know this, there are a lot of jobs in business reporting, um, and probably a lot more than uh, you might think. Um, and also, the hours are fantastic. It's, business, it's market hours, Monday through Friday. You rarely have to work a weekend. When I worked at CNN, I worked every weekend, I think, for three years, unless I was off for vacation, which I'm not, it was a great experience and I had a fantastic time, but uh, it was good to get a break. Um, so just little things to think about, but the, the real reason to go into you know business journalism is that there was some, just coming off the financial crisis, right? I mean, I, I don't know how old you guys are, I'm gonna guess, you know, but you guys were probably teenagers when uh, all these things happened just a few years ago and probably saw some of the ramifications. It's, I think it's infected almost uh, you know, in everybody's lives, but these are really important things that are happening in the economy, in the markets, and they impact people, right? And uh, I think there's a uh, misnomer that you know, business reporting is all about numbers. You, don't, you have to be good at math or accounting or something, which is actually the opposite. It's really about stories, about people, situations, and very important people. Y you're talking to you know the, some of the leading people in the industry, like you know my my beat at Market Watch. I cover banks and Wall Street, so I get to you know sometimes it can be you know um, stressful and, and and very intimidating. But you get to be around and talk to some of the you know leading uh, players on Wall Street, and it can be very exciting. And it's great to get to know these people and understand how these things work. And you can really, um, you know, carve out interesting, fantastic stories. I'm, I'm trying to think of one that I've done recently, as an example. Um, just like this is a, an, an example, just about the whole Russia-Ukraine situation. You know, um, I just did a story last week about how banks are, um, what banks are doing about that, and how it's going to impact them. You know, President Obama came, and you know, his administration is influencing you know, uh, U.S. corporations not to do business with Russia. I mean, that's a big story. And how it affects my job is like finding out how that's impacting the industry that I'm covering. So that's like a broader topic tied to uh, business reporting. Um, 
trying to think of what other fantastic uh, reasons. There, there are so many, but I it's not about the numbers, and it's definitely not about, you know, you don't have to be good at math. It's definitely about people and personalities and significant shifts in the industry, which you, you get to cover that impact a lot of things. So uh, I don't know if that, that helps. And I guess people follow it uh, not just because it's interesting and it's news, but because people are uh, have money invested in exactly, the, in the yeah, outcome, right. so you get this uh, whole additional audience. Uh, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. I, one of my favorite students always, uh, always carried around a skateboard, <laughs> uh, and uh, and you know always wearing jeans, always skateboarding everywhere. Now he's making a really nice living. Just a few months after graduating. Uh, covering an industry for a, a, a business website I'd never heard of. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Rebecca, uh, why is the New York Times, the classic print publication, suddenly so interested in video and bringing in an expert? Well, I mean, I don't think it really is suddenly. They've been doing it for I think at least 10 years they've been um, having video and using video. I think that part of the issue is that video is really expensive and um, as they were figuring out how to use their resources, they were making a lot of video, they were going up on the site, they were going off the site and kind of like stuck back into our pockets. So there was no way for us to really get a lot of eyes on what we were doing, get good distribution and get recognized for the excellent video that we were already doing. So part of um, my job was to come in and, and figure that and help figure it out, how to figure out how to build a more world-class video unit that is getting the distribution that it deserves to and that we're creating, um, you know, creating a Times branded video that wherever it's seen it gets recognized as, as what it is. So video is um, an important part of telling stories. We just, um, one of the latest videos we had up a couple days ago we got from one of the Sherpas that shot, uh, that was shooting as in film, shooting a, another Sherpa that was climbing and this was done like 10 minutes before that avalanche hit and that got sent to us and you know we're able to use video to really tell these, help continue to tell really compelling stories and adding a visual element. We've had stories that um, sometimes the video's done better than the article, right? Like we did a story about a, uh, it was a girls basketball team in the south somewhere, I can't remember, this was a little bit ago, but we did a documentary about one of the girls in this basketball team, and the reason that they were covering the basketball team, it was John, John Branch that wrote it, was because this basketball team had just continued to lose season after season after season, so they always went back and kind of visited this basketball team to see how they were doing. So he was sort of talking in general about this team and, and it's the impact of um, living in this small town where there was a lot of poverty. So we went and followed one of the girls on the team, and we did a documentary about her, it was called Hannah's Story, and it, again, this is a year old now, but it was just a beautifully well-told story that you got you into one person's perspective of going through something that had impact on a lot of people. So I think video just is a really great tool for journalists. I think your generation already, you know that when you're going through, journal, through J school now, you're learning how to, I'm sure, sh use your iPhones and shoot and take pictures and, and use social media to get your content out there. So you, it's a new generation, and I think it's about kind of catching, as we're catching up, this an older institution into figuring out how to use these newer tools. But there's, there's also a business reason, too. My understanding was uh, that there's a real advertising market for video. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. maybe yeah. should just that's talk about that That's undeniable. Bit. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. I mean, as this is, I think, uh, you'll, you can correct me, I think, on this, but I don't, I think it was just this past year where our subscription revenue uh, was, was more than our advertising revenue for the first time in our history. So advertising, has, we're ad, we're ad supported and we're subscription supported and the ad support part of it is there's concern that that is sl slowly declining and video is a place where it is rapidly growing and the amount of money that you can get for placing an ad on a video is much higher than you can get for example for a banner ad or one of the other kind of uh, ad units that we offer on the page so we did look at that as an incredible, it is, it is an incredible, undeniably incredible opportunity to be able to monetize video and uh, that was a big part of why it was brought in for sure and to figure out how to do that. And one of the things, there's a lot of things we did about it that are kind of complicated, but part of it has to do even with ad. We didn't even have an ad serving uh, platform that would attach ads to videos in a targeted way that we needed it to. So this past year we invested in that. Incredibly boring mechanics, but we had to do that. So yes, m economics is a huge part and there's a lot of um, expectation about the revenue growth that we'll see from video in the next couple of years. Uh, and, and Charles, 
I mean, is there really going to be a market for long form in this crazy world? You touched on that a little. Um, I think so. I mean, so our, our business model is a sort of weird hybrid business model where on one level we, you know, we hope to you know, expand our software side of things into you know, something that's really a sort of self-perpetuating uh, you know, company in its own right. And on the other hand, we sell our stories individually and we sell subscriptions. We, you know, we'll occasionally put things up for free for various reasons, but we're basically a sort of paid reading model, which has, you know, I think, upsides and, and big downsides also. Um, I mean, I think it's important to remember that there was essentially not ever a point, I don't think, where people were really truly paying for journalism. I mean, people were paying for advertising. Um, and advertising was paying for journalism, you know, for years. And that's just less and less the case. And so we kind of have to figure out some new way to do it. And I mean, one thing that is kind of interesting about what we've done is that on our editorial side, at least, it's, you know, it has been a sort of experiment in terms of like you know, how large of an operation can you support if you're really just asking people to um, pay for the work. And I'm actually you know, optimistic about it. I think um, one thing that we've tried to do and I think have hopefully proved is that you can do really good, you know, very ambitious, you know, long form writing and reporting without a giant sort of Condé Nast sized infrastructure. Um, you know, I love all those magazines and don't want anything to happen to them, but, you know, it's, it's a pretty incontrovertible fact that nobody's ever going to build anything of that scale again in this industry, and I would be very sad if the kind of writing that I like reading and, and like doing and enjoy editing uh, vanished just because people were like, okay, that was the only, you know, that was our only shot at this. Um, you know, not every new thing that needs to come along needs to be like portfolio where, you know, everybody blows just comical sums of money and they go out of business <laughs> in, in a matter of months. I mean, you can you know, do really good work with a, a you know, pretty small staff and still you know, compensate people reasonably well. And uh, you know, our hope is that, that we can keep doing that and that other people will keep doing that. So, so you should go into business, video, long form, and, <laughs> <laughs> and tweet a lot. I, I still can't get over that. All those tweets I get from the New York Times two days a week are from you. Yeah. That's Actually, it. sort of four days a week because I schedule. Which days? Uh, Wednesday, <laughs> Friday, Saturday. <laughs> you put little, you know, high Mitch notes in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so, if we had had this conversation a few years ago, it would have been a different conversation. I think we would have been talking about video maybe differently. I we probably would have been talking about business reporting in the same way. That's remained fairly constant. We would have been maybe more suspicious about the possibility of long form. Uh, now, you know, we've seen some sites are, are surviving, doing it. Uh, is, is it gonna change again in another few years? Is it, uh, is it, are we in for perpetual change in this industry or is it gonna kind of plateau and level off? Uh, I, I think it depends on which part of the industry you're talking about. Um, I think, you know, for instance, in the world of TV news, um, th there may not be that much change in five to 10 years because I think that there are a number of things about the economics of TV news that are just sort of ongoing. Uh, you know, if you uh, own a local TV news channel right now uh, or just a local TV channel, you're getting a lot of money from cable companies who carry your channel. Uh, you know, whether or not you sell advertising uh, at higher degrees or not. So that means that you have this sort of fountain of money that's coming into you from that. And I mean, there are instances in which the TV networks end up fighting with the cable companies or the satellite TV companies and so on. But a fair amount of that money is making it back to the news divisions because in some cases, a lot of these local TV channels, uh, you know, the news is really kind of the only thing that they make. Uh, I have a, a friend who uh, just accepted a job working for uh, one of the major uh, you know, TV networks, uh, or I, I guess I shouldn't say one of the major TV networks, one of the major TV station owners, they're trying to create a new national TV news program. Um, and so what that sort of says to me is that there's just sort of uh, you know, some, some unchanging economics that are going into that part of the business. But I think it's pretty different when it comes to uh, you know, newspapers. I think a lot of local newspapers have this problem uh, 
where they, uh, for years, were relying, um, like, like, like Charlie said, on uh, you know advertising uh, and you know classified advertising in particular. And now everybody's on Craigslist or uh, you know other alternatives to Craigslist that have spawned in order to find out uh, you know who's selling things in their town and so on and so forth. And a lot of the you know reasons that you know these. Uh, local newspapers existed, you know, it was like basically the one place where you could get, uh, you know, certain types of news, um, you know, on a daily basis. Well, now we have the internet, and that's not going to change. So I think that, uh, you know, it really depends on which sector you're talking about. The one thing I was going to say is, like, I guess the next shift, like, I know we're anticipating uh, at Market Watch is the way people consume news. It's, it's all on your phone, right? I mean, it's already started to happen, and I'm sure all of you probably only look at your phone for, I don't know, <laughs> I'm stereotyping, but uh, only look at your phone for information. But I know for my job, like, I now write shorter stories, so it's, and the way I write them, the way I format them is so it's easy to read on the phone. Mm. And I think that's a, a major shift in the w just the way we're thinking about looking at stories and news and journalism. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that's about right. Especially like, I'm sure video is similar, like people are watching so much more video and, and we're anticipating for that, right? And I, I guess, um, I think for video, like we were talking about earlier about the, re you know, the resource, it's very resource intensive and we're starting to see new platforms develop that are making video more easier to, or more inexpensive to shoot. I think we'll see more of these um, there's a platform. There's a platform we use ourselves on our iPhones that allows us to, and this is not going to be new to you guys because you have this on your phones, but to shoot and to cut and to do your voiceover, but to send it directly to our CMS. And there's companies like Touchcaster coming out, which allow you to shoot with your iPad, and you can also upload articles and photos. So as you're watching back your video and you're w talking about something that might be happening, you can click on a map and that fills the screen. So all these new tools are coming, and I think we'll start to see. I think that's going to help lessen the pressure on the heavy resources that it currently demands for video. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, things are, are changing at a remarkable pace. But I think, I mean, one thing that, you know, I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon, if at all. And uh, what I, I do think it's worth noting that there's an interesting change that's really happened, I think, just in the past few years, which, you know, where people have gone from, I think, like, furiously attempting to innovate out of sort of desperation to actually innovating and like, I can't believe I just used the word innovating, um, coming, <laughs> like coming up with new, new ideas for things in, in a sort of, um, in a more kind of hopeful and experimental fashion. And I think that's true of both companies like the Times, which has really done extraordinary work in that regard, and also in the sort of profusion of startups that really have, have appeared in just the last few years. Um, I mean, I think it, it's easy to forget that there wasn't anything, yeah, I'm very excited to see things like Vox in 538 and things like that that people are investing a lot of money in, um, yeah, actually getting off the ground. And who knows if these things will, will succeed or not, but this is a big shift from kind of where people were at, you know, four years ago when it was a sort of sense of desperation, like, oh, we need to start doing this stuff to survive. Um, now I think people are thinking more in terms of the potential for, you know, what we could be doing that's interesting or how we could actually be creating, you know, better, you know, media on, you know, Know, with the, the tools that we have now. Um, I mean, I do have kind of big existential like, questions about sort of how the speed at which everything is sort of being created and destroyed right now actually affects the sort of, you know, long-term quality of the work that we do. I mean, I think that a huge amount of energy now is going towards just coming up with sort of broad conceptual ideas for how we do this stuff better rather than just doing the stuff better. Um, and I don't think the two are mutually exclusive, but there's a huge amount of bandwidth. I mean, we had like a lot of time to kind of figure out how to put together a good looking magazine or how to put together a good newspaper. And now things are sort of changing so quickly that, uh, and this may just reflect my own kind of biases as somebody who would rather just be doing the work than sort of thinking about the big picture questions about how we do the work. But um, I mean, that's sort of consuming a lot of bandwidth right now, which is both good and bad. And I like to hope that eventually we get on the other side of that and people kind of know what are the categories of things that we're doing now and we can actually get back to spending you know, more of our resources on doing those things. But it is, I mean, the, the flip side is that it's exciting and fun right now to be able to play around with all this stuff in a way that you couldn't very recently. And I think there's really nothing stopping anybody from going out you know, with really very limited resources and creating like a new cool thing that everybody will then copy. Um, you know, that was essentially what we did four years ago. Um, and and you know, a lot of people have done things like that since then. 
um, and before that. And I think um, you know that's you know that's something that would have been unthinkable certainly when I started out in the business. So, so should these people, if they want jobs in journalism, should they be on Twitter? Should they be uh, learning video? Would that be wise? We know they should be studying economics if they have some interest in it, or maybe taking a course, or maybe uh, learn something about business. Should they be going to the to Alaska and uh, freelancing or, or working for? I mean, should they go somewhere? Should they should they start their own blog? What should they do? Uh, I mean, no, there's an obvious, we, we've learned that there's no one answer because you've all done it in, some, in such varied ways, but what would you recommend? I, I, I think the, the most important thing, um, I, I, you know, I always try to take a really humble approach to uh, you know, how people find their own path because there are so many different paths. I mean, I remember having a, you know, a writing teacher in college who said, listen, a, a lot of you are sitting here thinking that you're going to have like, careers as writers, but you're just not. And you know, I just remember how off-putting that felt. It, and then you know, in contrast, I, I had a, I had a, a, you know, when I was when I was trying to sort of, you know, get to my next job after my my first job out of grad school, which was okay but not great. I you know, I, I sat down with a, a guy I knew who I had a lot of uh, respect for, and you know, I asked him, you know, all these questions about how are you doing what you're doing, and how can I get where I'm going, and so on. And the you know, he, he said this thing that's always stuck to me, which is he said, you know, y you think I've got it all figured out, but I don't know what I'm doing in 12 months. And so I think having that kind of humility about, you know, uh, you know what the right path is is, is pretty important. Um, but I think what it also sort of communicates is the idea that it's, it's really good to just sort of have kind of a community outlook uh, while you're trying to, you know, find your way through your career. Um, you know, and, and just sort of have this understanding that, like, there are other people around you who probably have really good ideas about things that are happening at any given moment. And so, you know, the friends that you make in school or the friends that you make uh, in places where you're working, you should really be thinking a lot more, uh, you know, about, you know, staying in touch with them and seeing what their ideas are than necessarily anything that any of us have to say. Because, I mean, that's ultimately how I sort of found my way from one job to another uh, or helped other people I knew uh, you know, find their way from one job to another is like I would hear about something and I would say, hey, um, this might be good for you and vice versa. So I think that you know, sort of taking that sort of community outlook to your career is probably more important than anything I can tell you. And, you know, the one, the one nice thing about something like having a blog or being on Twitter or you know, using whatever platform comes next as like the one that is, uh, is really important is that um, it's a great way to sort of keep the conversation going uh, when you're not necessarily with people. Um, you know, I mean, I think there was, there's a, there, there was a reporter at Gawker who sort of said that, like, you know, the, the different subcultures that sort of exist on Twitter, for instance, it's just sort of this, like, great chat room. We're all sort of, like, constantly talking to each other all day. And that's, that's how you hear about things. And uh, that's how you also get ideas for, um, you know, things you should be trying out and doing. More advice on you know, um, someone said this to me recently, but I think the most important thing is to figure out what you like, right? You obviously like journalism, that's why you're in this room, but within journalism, what do you like to do? And, you know, would it some, what's that famous quote, content is king, right? <laughs> Just be really good at what you do. I mean, if you really love some, like a topic like business, for example, like if you really like it, you know, really get good at it and really enjoy it and, you know, um, uh, and I think that will drive you to, you know, where you're, where you're gonna go. Right. I mean, obviously, you have to be savvy. So you have to be smart and like what you do, and you know, work hard at it. But you also have to be savvy. Yeah, you have to realize that. Be aware of Twitter, and you know, I made a list recently of all the things I have to keep up with. I have to keep up with Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Tout, Vines. I mean, I, I literally have to remind myself every day. Oh yes, don't forget. If there's an opportunity for me to do any of those things, I should take it. But ultimately, you have to be savvy about it. Realize, like, be aware of all these things that are out there, and figure out how you can use them best, right? Um, and I know at, you know where I work, we're m encouraged more and more to just be a little bit smarter about our tweets. You can't just tweet something and just say, you know write the title of my story. It's all about you know how do you draw the readers in. If you're really excited about your story and you're passionate, you think it's a really important story that everyone should read, there's always a smart way to figure out how people should read it, right? And it's up to you to like figure that out. So I would say that. And the other thing, and I think you were alluding to this, is networking, right? Meet as many people as you possibly can and talk to as many people as you possibly can to really help figure out what you want to do and what you're good at and 
really hone that you know focus. So uh, that's what I would say. Yeah, I think it, what's going to separate you guys from you know what the more legacy journalists is that you understand what it means to you know write a piece of content, a piece of journalism, <coughs> and know how to keep pushing it through. It's not just about delivering your story; it's about following that story through social media. It's pushing it out in all the ways that you possibly can. And that was, it's kind of a big revelation. At the Times recently, there's an innovation report that was just published, and that was one of the recommendations that we have to make sure our journalists are really aware of where, the video, where, the, where their articles are going to be read and how to continue to promote them once they've delivered them. And that's a, that is a big change at the Times. I'm sure for you guys, it's, you know, it's kind of what you think about. And I think you bringing that to these, these if you do decide to work for a legacy company, bringing that will be really important in having the, that skill set. Is, is really valuable, even though you probably take it for granted. It's something that um, is, is really important. But the other thing was just a little antidote that I was, I was gonna share, because there were antidotes being passed around, but I remember when I was um, trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and I heard this uh, report on NPR, and it was about, they had done a study, it was a sociological study that was done um, trying to figure out, understand why certain people were lucky and why certain people were unlucky. And they took a group of people that considered themselves lucky, <laughs> and they took a group of people that considered themselves unlucky, and they had them each walk this three blocks, starting in the same spot and ending in a cafe, one at a time. They didn't know the other people were doing it, and they planted money along the way on the ground. And the lucky people found the money because they were looking around when they walked. They looked around, they took things in, they looked down, they looked up. And the unlucky people didn't find it because they were just kind of, you know, they were shut in and they weren't looking around them. And I always thought that was such an interesting study. When they got to the cafe, they had planted some actors as businessmen and they had them sitting around and the lucky people ended up, or business people or whatever, people who had companies, people that had success in their careers and it turned out the lucky people actually started conversations with them. They sat down next to them. They didn't know who, who they were but they just started because they were, they were social and they started chatting to these people whereas unlucky people didn't. Anyway, it's all, it's all I, think, I think about that a lot and that's always stayed with me just because I think it's just about keeping your head up and like we said, you know, continuing to look for opportunities because you never know where they're gonna come. Um, I was to take kind of a probably not very helpful big picture philosophical view of this, which is that like journalism is, is, I mean, being a reporter is the most fun job there is, but it's also not a job that's defensible by any sane rationale as like, a career choice. I mean, you'll probably like run out of jobs like at some point in your 30s, like I probably will run out of jobs <laughs> at some point in my 30s. And, and you'll never make as much money as like your you know, peers who are lawyers or, or whatever, but um, and, but if you accept that fact, I mean, there's some people, like me included, who really have no idea what else we would do, and um, you should just figure out how to do what you want to do. I mean, I think that, that too much emphasis is placed on sort of keeping up with things, which I don't think is very useful. I mean, you should be on Twitter if you want to be on Twitter or if it seems useful in a way that you can understand to actually doing the work that you do. Um, you shouldn't otherwise. I mean, there's, there's essentially no benefit to it, I think, from the standpoint of, like, you know, funneling people towards your work. Like, that's pretty well demonstrated by the data on it, I mean, it's much less good than something like Facebook for that. Um, and there's a sort of, I mean, there's always kind of a cargo cult of new technologies, I think, especially in media, which is always so terrified of being left behind that, like, you just kind of need to be on everything because it's gonna, you know, because everything, everybody else is on it and it's somehow just the, the fact of being on it is gonna solve some sort of problem for you. Um, and yeah, I find Twitter like very useful in some jobs that I've had and, and been just like an utterly useless, time-sucking, you know, purely deleterious phenomenon in my life at other times. Um, and yeah, I'm not on Facebook, not out of any like philosophical opposition, but because I know I would just waste so much time on it that it would be massively counterproductive. But yeah, that said, I don't work in the New York Times, so I don't air market watch, so I don't actually have to, you know, be competing for people's eyeballs on a daily basis, but um, but I think it is possible. I mean, I, I definitely know people who've kind of like, you know, I, th I think if something feels like something you should be doing, then it's something you should be doing. And if not, it, you know, it isn't. And the important thing is to look for opportunities that might be interesting, whether that's sort of, you know, in, in the sort of day-to-day -day practice of your job. I mean, if, you know, there is something you'll get out of being on Twitter, you should be, you know, on there and sort of seeing what's there. Um, but, I mean, it's also true of sort of the jobs that come your way. I mean, I think that, you know, I've always tried to be to the best of my ability, you know, there definitely were periods where I was they were motivated by abject fear of like prolonged unemployment and you know, sort of <laughs> made job decisions that way. But um, but I think you always kind of have to keep an eye out for like, huh, this is this may not be exactly what I want to do, but it's an interesting opportunity, and I'll learn something about myself and sort of what I want to be doing um, 
by doing it. And you know, again, I think that's true on a sort of career trajectory level, and it's true on a sort of day-to-day -day practice of what you do level. Um, you know, in some respects, you guys are way less lucky than we were in that you are you know, graduating at a time when there's no clear path for how you sort of get from point A to the hypothetical point B that you want to end your career at. Uh, I mean, when I started out, I was a newspaper reporter, and this was sort of the last probably year or two that there was something resembling a normal newspaper industry. And you know, like Michael was saying before, I mean, there was a sort of like deadening logic where like you basically worked at a little paper for two years, and you worked at a slightly less little paper for five years, then you worked at like a sort of large Metro Daily for however long it took you to get a job at the Miami Herald or the Rally Observer, one of the papers that fed people into the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post or the New York Times, and it was this like super mechanical kind of and very much inherited from newspapers' history as a, as a trade industry. I mean, it was, you know, your sort of ascent was governed more by the amount of time you put in than, you know, it's, it certainly was possible for very talented people to leap ahead, and it was an industry, industry that definitely rewarded kind of enterprising and talented people, but it also, you just kind of slogged through it a lot of time. Um, and on one hand, that was comforting, because you knew you would have a decent job with a pension and you could actually retire at some point. Um, but on the other hand, yeah, th I think that you guys are in a, in a sort of weird way in a, in a luckier position in that you don't have to be sort of constrained by those career paths and you have more opportunity to kind of make interesting things on your own. Um, and that's also, I'm sure, just absolutely terrifying, but um, in a lot of ways it's, uh, you know, it's a lot more fun than what you know, people of my age or older did for the first you know, decade of their career. Questions? You <coughs> killed the radio star a long time ago, you know. So, um, and then it kind of developed into actual documentaries on, like, short documentaries on sites, and um, and you know, and that's been around for a long time. And you know, even though there's still, still, you know, some magazines and newspapers that are just now, you know, jumping on the bandwagon. You know, a lot of people are have done it for a long time. So, the next. So what, what's the next thing, like the next format? Okay, so it was like video news stories and then you know, like actual documentaries and then okay, so now everyone's doing that. You know, how, you know what else are we gonna do to stay ahead of the game? You know, like the next, like when you did Snowfall, I mean that was groundbreaking, you know, and it's like is it gonna be more, more stuff like that? Like, or is it gonna, is there gonna be a whole new surprising format? or is it a secret or, no, or yes, it's totally a secret so I can't <laughs> talk about it here. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the, the, you know, the Times won two Pulitzers this year for photography and one of those photographers, um, where was it? There, Josh. Thank you, Josh, Josh Hainer. Hainer, Josh Hainer, sorry. Sorry, journalist gods. Uh, Josh Hainer um, was shoot also shot a video that accompanied that and it was an amazing video and I think we're gonna see more of our photographers also shooting video. And I, I see us having more of a visual desk in the future rather than just a video desk or a multimedia desk. I think we'll see a visual desk where everyone is, is working together and, and telling, um, telling stories in, in, in many different ways. So I, I, that's one prediction I have. But in terms of format-wise, whether or not it's gonna be long or short or tiny little vines, I really I don't know. I think we're seeing that people are actually watching longer content online than they have before. So we are we are making more doc long form documentaries, but we're also continuing to make short form. So I can't predict the format. I'd, I'd predict a little bit longer form, but I don't really know. If I could jump in, I would the, the thing that I think is awesome that you guys do that nobody ever talks about is the OpDocs series, which is just, I don't know if you guys watch these, but they're like kind of, I guess, medium length, like not terribly over conceptualized, yeah. over thought out. Um, yeah, it's almost kind of like a it's like a cool sort of video notebook sort of thing with like animations or or just kind of short films and um, I don't know I think that's that's cool I mean I think that yeah. you guys are doing a lot of cool things that people tend to not talk about as much as something like Snowfall which everybody talks about all the time. I'm loud. Uh, 
I know this, yeah, this is a follow-up. Uh, the times isn't usually like compared to Vice, but uh, would you guys ever consider going into like your own program or TV show? Because when I'm on JetBlue and I'm riding and I see those little videos, I'm always like, this would be like even just a great network. Like I think New York Times could have its own network. Um, would you guys, are you guys ever like in talks of that or considering it? Because if I was the head of it, I'd be like, yo. More I'm secrets, <laughs> can't say. No, yeah, of course we do. I mean, I think that's one of the things this past year we've been looking at, because if you look at, we just redesigned the website. It was launched two weeks ago. You guys should check it out. And it's more, uh, there's channels now, and it really does look like a network, and there's original programming in all of them. So we do have those conversations, and um, we're working really to figure out which of what content makes sense on what platforms, and so we are, we are in talks about that. So yeah, I think you'll see something like that. Um, we're gonna do the pre-roll device, devices uh, show on HBO. No. Or not, but uh, yeah, I think I you. Watched. Yeah, would you? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I think you'll see some of that in this next year. Really, this first year is getting all of our current programming going, and then this next year is about figuring out that next step. Well, just, just one thing about about you know institutions like Vice that, that I think is really interesting to think about. Um, you know, depending on what your career interests might be, is that there, there's a really strong difference that I think exists between between you know doing the job of of delivering the news and doing the job of entertaining people. You know, uh, when Vice recently launched their new thing, it was called Vice News to distinguish it from everything else Vice, which is not news, right? That's fine. Like, I, I don't fault, you know, BuzzFeed for producing a lot of really great entertaining stuff. But, you know, the question is, how much should those of us who are involved in the news business take lessons from them? The answer is sometimes, and in a lot of other cases, it is not. And, um, you know, there are a lot of people who sort of start out in journalism and decide that what they're really more interested in is entertaining people. Uh, you know, maybe a lot of you have seen The Wire on HBO, you know, he used to be a journalist, right? So, you know, that, I think that's an example of sort of the difference between those two different segments of ways of, you know, appealing to people's intellects. And, you know, some of you might be more interested in entertaining people than delivering the news. That's fine, think about that. Well, BuzzFeed has a news section, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's, it's sort of like NBC has NBC News, and then it has the voice. Um, so uh, you're saying that you think, I guess, visual journalism, we might be seeing like a larger visual desk in the future. But uh, I mean, I think it was last spring, one of the larger Chicago newspapers fired their entire photo staff. And we see more and more of that photojournalism and photographers and videographers are the first being laid off. Uh, I was just wondering, um, if you had anything to say to that, or um, what you think, uh, or why you think people might be laying off these people first? Yeah, I, I actually can't. I can't answer that, I, and particularly around. Um, I mean, video doesn't make sense to me just because, as we talked about, there's an enormous revenue uh, potential in, in con continuing to create video, but it is it is really expensive. It's expensive to make, and if you're if you're finding if you're a newspaper and you're having trouble, it, it could be the first place you might want to cut because it's there's a lot of overhead in that. I think in the future, I think moving forward um, again. I, I'd love to hear from you guys because I'm just assuming that you are learning all these different tools in terms of using your phones and taking pictures and you know to accompany your stories. So I think there'll be more pressure on the journalists to cover more things. I think already there's more pressure on them than ever before. I mean, as she was just talking about having to manage <laughs> six different accounts, and you know I, we hear a lot of kvetching about that at the Times, and I guess it's already it's a lot just to deliver your freaking story, and then you have to do all this extra work around it too. Um, and I think there'll even be more in terms of we're already, we're training our journalists now to shoot. We've, t we've trained almost 200 journalists now to use their phones and shoot, and we're gonna continue to train them for that exact reason, because it's, it's A, it's excellent, because they can tell better stories with it, but um, we can, we won't, the resources, uh, we can not spend as much money on creating content if the journalists are helping us create the content. I mean, that's just the truth of it. One, one quick thing I was gonna say, you guys are actually in an excellent position, because you, this is like, second nature to you guys, you know, we, yeah. you know, the people who are already in the industry, we have to learn all these new things about using, you know, your phone and editing and all of that stuff. I mean, I luckily have had a TV background, but most print reporters don't. So it's a whole new thing. This is probably something you do, you know, with your eyes closed, I don't know. So it's a, yeah. it's a huge advantage. Uh, Mika? Rebecca, you talked about promotion and that's sort of a new thing journalism, how to promote your story. I try to do it with, a, with my blog that I write online, I, I record online. 
what's what's the traje trajectory of a story? You put it up, and what you go to your colleague and say, "Hey, retweet my story." What what's the trajectory of of, of promoting story? You know, there, there's not one answer. Of course, we'd love to get it. Uh, we'd like to get on the main uh, Twitter accounts. So we're always bugging this team to see if they can post our content, and they're very discerning about what they post, which is why their why their why their Twitter feed is so excellent. Um, but yes, I mean, you, for us, we're always encouraging people to think about. Is this a weird echo? Or is it just me? No, that's better. That's better. That doesn't work. I'm just gonna. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Thank you. So I, I think that uh, we're always encouraging people when they write their stories to think about other outlets that might like that story. So when we're writing something, we did something about a, a model in India who became the first deaf model, and we, you know, it didn't perform that well here, but in India, it performed really well. So we have to make sure we get it to the right platform where people are going to get and find that story who have that interest. So we really have to get the story to where people are watching who have that interest. So it's thinking about the other platforms, the blogs, the other people, you know, tweeting it to people that may be interested in it who may then retweet it to other people. So platform is Google or do you tweet it like, hey, this No, I mean, for us it's a little different just because we can email them and say, hey, we've got this Times article, but I mean, I'm sure you could too, and we get, we get stuff sent to us as well. So I think, um, uh, yeah, so I, do th I think it's really important, and it, that's why you have to continue to build your own social networks, too, always, I think. I mean, I know sometimes it seems ridiculous, but I think in, in terms of getting in front of the best, most people, it's important to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you can email people, too. I mean, just, just because we have this great corporate communications department whose job it is to, you know, inform our, uh, our peers and our competitors and other people who we want to reach out to that we're producing all this great stuff, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think in you know, 2005, 2006, 2007, when I was you know first getting started and working as a blogger and covering the news, if I wrote something that I thought somebody would be interesting to, I would track down their email address and send it to them. Um, and I think that's how a lot of stuff in the world of blogging used to work. Uh, blogging has you know sort of uh, you know gone down the slides a little bit relative to uh, the rise of social media. And social media, I think, so much of it is just knowing that you're a part of a conversation. And so when you have something that you want to self-promote, um, if you're already sort of engaged in conversation with other people, uh, you don't look like a jerk who's standing up and saying, look at me, look at me. Because if you're sort of on in an ongoing active conversation, people are kind of interested in hearing what you have to say next. And, and another quick thing, like if you, if you want people to tweet your, your things, you should be generous and tweet other people's stories. And you know, that's a good way to like create interest and following. And you know, you're returning a favor. So you spoke about a distinction between like entertainment and news, um, but coming from a writing background that's a little more creative, I'm wondering if there's a space in long form journalism for humor or um, in journalism in general to not of course spill something that I see your very um, distinction, which is important, but is there a space for having humor and entertainment in long form? I think so. Um, actually, yeah, I was biting my tongue earlier. I would push back very strongly against the idea of distinguishing, drawing a hard and fast distinction between entertainment and news. I actually love a lot of what BuzzFeed does. I don't love everything that they do, and you know, I don't need to see another picture of a cat as long as I live, but <laughs> you know, if it pays the bills for them hiring really good reporters, which they do, then I don't care. Um, I, have a, you know, I think that's great. I, I have a much bigger problem with some of the other models out there where people are now sort of operating as hybrid sort of content agencies for brands and also doing journalism on the side. And that, yeah, it's been very depressing to me to watch the sort of ethical standards that people had slide dramatically. But no, I mean, I think that, I mean, people used to have no, you know, you know there's, there's one category where this has never been a real distinction that anybody's drawn, and that's magazines, where, I mean, I don't know where you would draw the line between, say, like, a, you know, investigative piece, uh, you know, in you know, the New Yorker and the, the art section of the New Yorker. I mean, I don't think there's a dividing line between, you know, it'd be hard to really pin down the difference between a Dexter Filkin story and like a Joan Acasella review of a dance performance. Um, you know, one's criticism and one is reporting, but they're all sort of under the umbrella of the same enterprise. And I don't think that, you know, it's any different with kind of, you know, quote unquote lowbrow stuff. I think those things can, can quite happily coexist. And yeah, the best magazine writers um, are, are people who I think tend to have a blend of those skills who are 
you know, on one hand, actually very good reporters, and on the other hand, are, are sort of great and entertaining stylists. And you know, somebody like John Jeremiah Sullivan is a great example, who you know is actually a sort of shockingly good reporter, although he goes to great lengths to disguise that in his writing because he has this sort of engaging, sort of bumbling naif persona that he uses. But you know, he's actually ex extremely good at reporting. Um, and and yeah, and I think that I mean that was sort of. Yeah, I, I think that I'm sort of a fatalist about how newspapers sort of ended up, you know, going wrong. I don't think you know, people beat themselves up about this a lot, but I don't know if there was a whole lot that people could do. But it did. I mean, I think the fact that they were essentially a sheltered monopoly for as long as they were allowed people to sort of uh, shield, you know, who worked at them to shield themselves. And I include myself in this as an ex-newspaper reporter, but you know, people were sort of able to shield themselves from the reality that in order to inform people, you have to entertain them enough to have them read your story. I mean, I think that the people who were really sort of purely news oriented deluded themselves into thinking that people were buying the newspaper for their stories rather than for the sports section or the classified ads, the cartoons. Um, the cartoons. <laughs> and I don't think those things should ever be really divorced from each other. I mean, I d I, at the same time, I'm, yeah, I don't think you should have entertainment decisions overruling, you know, you should do stories about important things because they're important, you know, regardless of whether they're entertaining. And you know, I feel like I, I have some standing on this having worked at you know, policy magazines that publish some incredibly boring stories about <laughs> very, very dull, serious, but important issues. Um, and you shouldn't allow the sort of entertainment um, obligation to sort of override your, your sort of responsibility to tell people things that are important. But it's important to realize that you should be. I mean, you, you know, somebody, I think that everybody should ideally have some aspect of both of those skills. Uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to have to go quickly now and let our guests get back to work. Thanks. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm in the news and documentary video journalism track here, the master's program. And we are 15 students, and 13 of us are girls. And I was wondering what um, the ratio is of women to men in your organizations for editors and reporters? Um, I can start out. Our ratio is, in, in terms of editors, is 100% male because I'm the only full-time editor. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, but I think, I mean, to, to answer that more broadly, I, I do think that there's a huge gender skew in different sort of subsets of, of journalism. I used to work in public radio, which I don't know the actual numbers, but certainly everywhere I worked, or everyone I had to everyone I ever dealt with skewed very female. And then, you know, right now we're kind of um, a, a sort of adjunct of the, I think, glossy magazine world in terms of most of the writers that we use and stuff. And that's an overwhelmingly male-dominated environment, which we and I think just about everybody else in that space would very much like to not be the case. Um, a lot of times it's, it's a matter of, you know, it's a, it's a difficult thing to change quickly because so much of it is dependent on the sort of, you know, paths that people follow into the business and for reasons that are way too complicated for me to wade into now and you know cut off everybody else um, they exist but you can I know this came out this morning in our clip reports but I think it's uh, is it 68 percent male in the newsroom Yeah, I think, well, anyway, there was an article just this morning talking about it, and it is definitely something that the Times ha has more male journalists than I think its competitors, I want to say, but just slightly, according to that. I, I guess I would say, like, it also sort of depends on which team you're talking about. I mean, my, my desk, the social media desk, we have, uh, you know, six full-time employees, and, uh, you know, four of us are women, and two of us are men, and three of us just had babies, so... You know, I think it really just sort of depends on the the, the, the operation that you're talking about. Yeah, I think overall it's true of uh, most of the time that way. But in, in higher level positions, for sure, there's a lot of there's definitely a lot of women at, at the helm in terms of the editorial and the second in command gamut. There's a, a lot of desks are held up by women. I'd say the video department is probably close to 50 50. That's, that's interesting because that's the opposite in TV. It's when I worked at. Um, at CNN or Fox, I would say 70 to 80% of uh, the people working there were women, um, which I think is typical for TV. Um, and then um, at the top management was primarily male. Well, I would love to see that change, <laughs> that trend change. Um, but then now that I've switched over to online and print, I think it's the opposite. Like it is more, more males. It's a more of a mix, but I would say skewed towards guys. One more question, then we should let our guests 
right, so I don't know what your global backgrounds are, but for like some, what advice would you have for someone who's looking to go, maybe not just in the American journalism market, but like outside, um, should we start as like international correspondents or should we look outside to like global news net networks or what kind of advice? So I, I be just because of the, the grad school I went to, I, I went to, to CIBA, Columbia, and I, you know, I have, uh, have plenty of classmates who uh, you know, were trying to sort of push their way into things like foreign correspondent jobs and so on. Um, I think it's very difficult these days uh, to, it, it can be done, but uh, I think you have to take a certain kind of risk. You have to have a certain buccaneering attitude that you can just sort of uh, you know, dive into a difficult place and uh, be ready for things to not really work out. Um, because these days, fewer news organizations are investing a lot of money in things like uh, full-time foreign, co foreign correspondents. So I think what ends up sort of happening is that you have to sort of start out working as like a stringer, uh, you know, um, sort of be at the ready to cover things when they happen, um, you know, for the news organizations that you may or may not be contracted to. So, you know, um, I, you know, personally, like I sort of looked into that life, you know, I lived in Jakarta for a while, while I was there, I talked to a number of journalists, you know, the people at the Washington Post basically told me, you know, if you want to try to get a job for the Washington Post, it's just not going to work out. We're mostly interested in hiring locals in country who speak English. Um, so, you know, because it's cheaper and because they just know the country better than I ever would, unless, you know, I had some sort of dual national identity, which I didn't. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, if you do have a lot of knowledge of a place, if you speak the language very well, uh, and if you're very adventurous, there can be some opportunities, but you have to be sort of ready for things to uh, fail, perhaps catastrophic catastrophically. So is your question about starting off working in another country for an American news organization or, or moving into news organizations in another country? Yeah, I think, I mean, two points on that. I mean, when, when I was at Foreign Policy, I mean, we relied enormously on, on young freelancers who were in interesting places where we didn't know people, um, and even in places where we did know people. I mean, and I think that's actually, you know, it's, a, it's a very good time to do that um, as a sort of you know, young person getting out of school, um, partly because, as Michael said, you know, basically everybody has massively scaled back their bureaus everywhere where they don't absolutely need to have them with, with probably the exception of the Times at this point, and, and that's about it. Maybe like the BBC has people around, but um, um, and but there is still an appetite for that. Uh, I think there's an appetite for international news in a way that there actually wasn't not that long ago, and it's also become much easier to get connected with news organizations who would be interested in your work. Um, you know, I certainly spent a huge amount of time when I was at Foreign Policy trying to just like figure out. Who was you know who were like the three people who seemed to know what they were doing who were on the ground in like Yemen or um, you know I'm trying to think of other Bahrain or something like that I mean you, and and you kind of that's something that you know Twitter was very good for and I actually do think it's probably useful if you're like a you know, freelance foreign correspondent to be everywhere you can be because people will spot you there um, but uh, but yeah and I think there's a lot it's it's probably easier to get that work now and you can. You know, sometimes it does translate into, into jobs elsewhere. I think it does less than it used to, certainly. Um, I know people who kind of parlayed that background into you know, good jobs back in the US. Um, it, you know, it took a little while, but it was, a, it was certainly one of the more interesting, it was a, seemed like a much more interesting way into the profession than a lot of other ways people did it, just sort of moving somewhere you know, with enough money to get going for a couple months and then seeing how it worked out. Um, one thing that I've, I've discovered that's very interesting talking to people is that I the, the one sort of sector of the media that seems to have huge fluidity from country to country um, is, is people who are on the sort of digital development end of things. Um, you know, people who work uh, as sort of designers or on the graphics desk or things like that. I mean, like I know people who've jumped between you know, papers in several different countries doing that just because that skill set is in such demand and there are so few kind of legacy people at especially traditional news organizations that actually have it, that you can kind of write your own ticket and I think move pretty freely wherever you want to go. Um, it's like sort of the one booming job area, um, aside from like business journalists and probably political journalists that there really is. Um, so that's sort of one way if you really kind of feel like you want to you know, be able to, to go a lot of different places with sort of a minimum of 
of uh, friction between sort because you know different journalism cultures are very different from country to country otherwise and I think it can be hard to move laterally between them but it doesn't seem to be the case in that area. Charles Holmans of The Activist, uh, Rebecca Howard of The New York Times, Satel Patel, Patel of Market Watch, and Michael Rostin. We are so appreciative of you coming by and talking to us. This is great. You have influenced a generation of NYU journalists. Of that. <laughs>